Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, and first of all, thanks to the International Committee for arranging this important panel to discuss America's forgotten borders. Today, uh, I will be making a warmer presentation than uh, Senator Stevens uh, made, uh, no icebergs in the Caribbean, uh, and, but we will be discussing the impact of drug trafficking throughout America's forgotten Caribbean border and the violence that trafficking has detonated in the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. That is because in very real terms, Puerto Rico is now serving as a first line of defense along America's underprotected Caribbean border in the drug war, drugs that are entering the mainland from Key West to Portland, Maine, Maine throughout 13 states of the Union that border the Atlantic. Let me begin by outlining how Colombian cocaine arrives on the streets of many of America's major cities. Some of the cocaine will be loaded into planes for flights to the Dominican Republic where accomplices wait for the drop. Some will be stowed away on vessels bound from South America for U.S. ports. Other shipments will be smuggled to Venezuela, then sent via fast boat north through the islands. Semi-submersible submarines will be used to ship drugs undetected through maritime borders. These routes will converge on the U.S. territories in the Caribbean, which are Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, which are the place where America becomes a Caribbean nation. Once these drugs reach the U.S., the drug networks will ship them to cities along the eastern seaboard for sale in cities stretching from Miami, Newark, and Boston. Certainly, securing the nation's borders has been a major national focus. Over the last decade, the federal government has made headway in securing the U.S. southern border and in combating traffickers operating from Mexico, Colombia, and Central America to disrupt the drug trade and neutralize its influence. Plan Colombia, the Merida Initiative, the Central American Regional Security Initiative, and the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative are examples. But let me mention, for example, that for the Merida Initiative, the federal government has spent in the past three years $1.6 billion. But in the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, we've only spent $139 million. So there's an 11 to 1 uh, disproportion between what is being spent to secure the border with Mexico with what is being spent to secure the border in the Caribbean. But it's not enough to only secure part of the border. Now drug shipping routes through the Caribbean that were last prominent during the 1980s are being reactivated by Southern American cartels seeking illegal entry into the U.S. and not finding that entry in the Mexican border. In total, an estimated 30 percent of illegal drugs now reaching the U.S. mainland come from the Caribbean. We squeezed the balloon in one region, Mexico, and now drug criminals are shifting their routes back to penetrate the U.S. flank through the Caribbean. According to the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area's 2011 drug market analysis, an estimated 70 to 80 percent of the cocaine reaching Puerto Rico from Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, and Colombia is shipped to major U.S. mainland cities from Florida to New York. The DEA reported cocaine seizures along maritime routes between the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico increased 350 percent. We're not talking of a 20 percent increase, a 50 percent increase, a 100 percent increase, a 200 percent increase. We're talking of a 350 percent increase from two metric tons in 2009 to seven metric tons in the first three quarters of 2010. And that's just what they are seizing, not what is ultimately getting through. The rule of thumb is that law enforcement usually manages to seize about 10% of what is actually trafficked. The same report had some startling statistics about the impact supply and demand had on the street price of cocaine. According to the report, Cocaine prices declined overall from 2008 to 2010, suggesting that cocaine availability increased. The DEA Caribbean Division reports that the average price for a kilogram of cocaine in the region decreased from as high as $30,000 per kilo in October 2008 to as low as $16,800 in October 2010. Market forces dictate that a drop in street price by almost half resulted from a major surge in supply. And when you, when you reduce the price of cocaine, it means that a lot of people 
who are not using it start using it because they find it cheap enough to use. But when the price goes back up, then those people are in a bind and are forced to go into criminal activity to pay for their physiological needs. We face a nimble and well-financed foe. Puerto Rico has become a destination for illicit drug money coming from the U.S. mainland to fortify the drug trafficking network. Most of the bulk currency that passes through Puerto Rico originates on the East Coast, primarily Miami and New York, and flows to Colombian drug organizations. Those bulk cash shipments are moved by couriers aboard commercial aircraft, by express mail, and through shipping containers. Many of these express mail packages seized at the San Juan Airport in 2010 originated in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and New York. Once the currency hits Puerto Rico, it is shipped in bulk to cartels in Latin America or laundered via wire transfer to shell accounts throughout Europe and Asia. Drug traffickers positioning for lucrative territory have detonated a surge in violence. As a result, Puerto Rico is experiencing a murder rate over six times the national average, with over 70% of murders directly related to the drug trade. If the national number of murders went up six times, I can assure you that there would be a huge response from the federal government, because it only happens in Puerto Rico, out of sight, out of mind. That's simply unacceptable in any U.S. jurisdiction. Yet even with the scope of these issues, the U.S.-Caribbean border is barely contemplated in the most recent national drug control strategy, the NDCS. The federal government lacks a comprehensive multi-agency strategy to address the growing drug-related crime impacting its territories in the Caribbean. The government of Puerto Rico has asked the federal government to establish a U.S.-Caribbean border initiative similar to the efforts along the U.S. southern border. We must bolster resources, funding, and staffing of federal law enforcement agencies throughout Puerto Rico that remain understaffed and underfunded compared to their stateside counterparts. Since we took office in 2009, Governor Fortunio's administration has requested more effective law enforcement resources from federal authorities. We are already leaning heavily on our local law enforcement, deploying our National Guard, and better equipping our police force. We are launching new security measures and investing in equipment that will enable us, enable us to fully scan 100% of the cargo entering the port of San Juan by the end of the summer. The average percentage of scanning in every other U.S. port is between 2 and 5%. We are going to scan by the, late this summer 100% of our cargo. And we're doing it with a, enough of a equipment investment so that we won't be creating long lines waiting to go through the scanners. But until we have the full federal resources in place, the cartels will continue to aggressively ply their deadly trade. The underprotected U.S. Caribbean border will only worsen without focused resources and cooperation. Drug crimes will escalate and drug ne networks will expand their reach into your neighborhoods, further compromising safety. The situation does not have to end as a tragedy if the necessary resources are provided to fully protect our nation's vulnerable Caribbean border. If both state and federal partners make this issue a top priority, we can send a clear message that all U.S. borders will be protected unconditionally and that drug criminals' reign of destruction is over. Thank you.